Hey everybody, it's Chief Meteorologist Brad Benovich here at WCNC Charlotte. Today's topic is a fun topic. It's an interesting topic and it's also probably one of the most misunderstood topics that I get approached about. Um, everybody has heard of Doppler radar. You've seen it on TV, you've seen it on your phone, you've seen it online, but very few people really understand some of the basics of how Doppler radar works. More importantly, some of the advantages of Doppler radar, but also a lot of the disadvantages because we see it on maps. We think that Doppler radar is uniform and easily accessible everywhere. It really isn't. So I wanted to talk today about Doppler radar. I'm going to show you some real life examples. We're going to pull up the Doppler radar, show you some cool things we can do with it to kind of examine storms. But I wanted to focus a little bit today about the basics. So first things first, over on to my left or to you screen right over this way, you see what a Doppler radar tower looks like. It looks like a giant soccer ball on top of a cell phone tower. Now that soccer ball is actually what we call the ray dome. It protects the dish which is inside. There's a giant dish in there that is rotating generally once per minute or one RPM. And it's sending out a beam of microwave energy. So to show you what this looks like, I'm gonna show you a little diagram here. So this radar, and that's what it looks like if you take that soccer ball off it, um, which protects it from the elements and also um, allows it to kind of eliminate some of the, what we call ground clutter and other issues. It sends out a beam of energy that's microwave. Now the microwave energy is kind of similar to what's in your microwave oven. It's not as strong, obviously, but it's very similar. It shoots out, there's two parts, a transmitter and a receiver. So in the middle of the dish is the transmitter. It shoots out this pulse of energy. It goes out and bounces off of something. In, our, in this case, we're trying to bounce it off raindrops, hail, snowflakes, whatever's in the atmosphere. Sometimes though, because there's bugs, bats, dirt, other things, smoke, it'll bounce back and show up as well. And the dish receives that uh, as it rotates once a minute. Now, the frequencies we're talking about um, are basically microwaves. So you can see it right here in the middle of your screen. The size of the waves are pretty big. They're about the size um, between a human and a butterfly. So that's why we pick up a lot of insects. And you could see the the wavelengths get smaller as you go into the visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma rays, just to show you. And those wavy pattern you see at the top is essentially the pattern that we see in microwaves and kind of shows you that general frequency that we see with radar. Now, one of the interesting things about radar is the radar we use has a name called Doppler radar. You probably just take the Doppler part for granted, but this has to do with the Doppler effect. Now, what's the Doppler effect? Well, the Doppler effect means that the frequency of either sound waves or energy waves or even light waves change their frequency based on whether they're coming at you or away from you. So what you're looking at here is an ambulance um, that is traveling towards a person. The sound waves will change as the ambulance sound gets closer to you. You may have heard this at a train crossing where the horn of the train coming at you sounds like Meow. That's because of the Doppler effect. Now we use this with radar to show us when raindrops, snowflakes, or more importantly, wind, is going away or, or towards the radar. Um, and let me show you an example of this. I'm gonna actually mute my microphone here uh, in a second and show you this Doppler effect uh, with a YouTube video. So I'm gonna bring it up here. I'm gonna mute my mic and I'll bring up the audio here. And this is an example of what we call the Doppler shift, the change in the sound of this car horn coming at you and away from you. So here's the example. All right, did you hear that difference? The car horn is making the same sound until it gets past us and the frequency changes. That is the use of the Doppler effect. So why is this so important with Doppler radar? Well, it allows us to see if the raindrops are coming at the radar or away from the radar. So we can actually get wind speeds and direction based on whether the raindrops are going away or towards the radar. So a very important tool that we use. And I wanna show you, um, a tour of a Doppler radar that the National Weather Service used. So here's a close up view of it. Again, 100 feet tall, there's a ray dome at the top. The dome is about 39 feet tall, inside's a 28 foot diameter dish. So here's a look at this tower from below. You can see what it looks like close up. 
Here's all the instrumentation inside. Here's a view from the top looking back. I want to show you the inside here because there's a couple of views inside the ray dome and you can see that dish. So there's that giant dish which is rotating within the storm and sending or rotating within the ray dome and shooting out beams that are bouncing off of something in the sky. Now, what I'm gonna do is show you some of the pitfalls of Doppler radar because here are the locations of all the radars in the United States. Now, when you look at a radar map, you see the whole United States covered in radar. Well, what happens is what you're seeing in between some of these, I'm gonna actually grab my telestrator here. Um, so bear with me as I pull it up I'm gonna make it real thick. I'm gonna use blue so it's easier to see. So what you're seeing is normally the radar covers all of this, but these are the individual radars. So what they do is we composite the radars together. We fill in the gaps with imagery, even though the coverage is not that great in between. So I'm gonna zoom into the Carolinas to show you the location of the radars. This will let me zoom in. You can see the locations of the radars. And you may have seen me talk about this. We have a little bit of a radar gap, uh, a little bit. It's a pretty significant radar gap, a uh, north and east of Charlotte, where the radar beam is not as good. And why is this? Well, remember, the radar beam goes out in a straight line. And I'm going to show you a graphic that will explain this. Why is there a problem here? Well, remember, the Earth is curved. So when the radar beam goes out from the radar, it goes out in a straight line, but as it gets farther and farther away, remember the earth curves, so the earth gets farther and farther away from the, 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 the ground. So the radar beam starts looking higher and higher. Also, as the radar beam gets farther away down here, you can see it actually gets wider. So the radar beam starts really thin, but it gets really wide. So the farther you are from the radar, two things happen. The radar beam becomes very broad and the resolution goes down. It also becomes weaker because just like any piece of energy, the farther out it goes, it loses some of its momentum and energy. And it also is looking higher in the sky. So why is this a problem for radars? Well, imagine a storm is 10 to 25 miles away from the radar or up to 50 miles per hour, or 50 miles away from the radar. The radar beam would detect a tornado in the lowest levels of the storm. But as you get farther away, the radar beam is now looking 8, 10,000 feet above our heads and it might miss what's below it. So radar is not uniformly covering the earth. I always like to tell people it's like a cell phone tower. When you're close to the cell phone tower, you get five bars and a really good signal. If you're really, really far away, you only get one bar and you might get dropped calls. So the thing to remember is that when you're looking at radar data, you need to know where the radar is and how close. And that's what something as a meteorologist, we take into account when we're looking at storms. So for instance, if storms are close to the radar, we know we're sampling the lowest part of the storm. As they get farther away, we know we're looking higher up. So there's things we look for higher up that would give us indications of what's happening below. But it's really important to know these downfalls. This is also why a lot of people think storms go around their house because the storm gets farther away from the radar, it tends to look weaker on your phone. So people will pull up their phone and go, look, it looks like the storm split around me. It really didn't split around you. It's more of a factor of it's getting farther away from the radar and the radar is not seeing it. This is also why sometimes storms moving through the mountains look like they're getting weaker. And a lot of people think the mountains break it up. But if you look carefully on the map, the mountains are in an area where there's not really good coverage. So as they cross the mountains, it looks like they weaken because they're getting out of range of the radar. So this is really important to understand some of the downfalls of the radar, but also some of the things that radar can allow us to do. That Doppler radar effect or the Doppler shift can let us look at some pretty cool things. So this is actually a current radar. So I'm bringing the radar up in real time. The product you're looking at now is reflectivity. So the radar beam is bouncing off of raindrops, maybe even a little bit of hail here and bouncing back to the radar. But I can look at the Doppler winds as well. So on the right, you can see the Doppler winds and some of these brighter returns up towards Winfield, which is in uh, parts of uh, um, um, Louisiana, Northern Louisiana, Southern Arkansas. You can see those winds, if you look over on the left, are getting close to 60 miles per hour. And we know the plus sign means they're going away from the radar. The negative sign means they're going towards the radar. So one of the cool things we can do with radar, not only does it shoot out a beam at the lowest levels, it will scan vertically into the sky. So it'll do slices as it goes higher. And when you put those all together, you can get really cool 
3D images of the storm. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So we're gonna do what's called a volumetric scan of the storm. And when we scan it, we can get a 3D rendering of what the storm looks like. So what's happening here is you can actually see the structure of the storm, cumulonimbus cloud down to the bottom. It actually looks like a thunderstorm with the overshooting top. So a picture perfect look at a thunderstorm. So what the radar is doing, it shoots a beam here, 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 here. It shoots several beams up and then it composites them together to create what we call a volume scan, a scan of the storm. And why is this important? Well, now I'm not underneath this storm, but I know exactly what it looks like by looking at it. Something else we can do with that volume scan is we can do a cross section. We can slice across the storm and see what it looks like in the vertical. So you can see the, the legend here. This is 60,000 feet at the top. This storm right now in Louisiana is up around 46,000 feet into the atmosphere. And we can plot lines on this as well. This red line is minus 20 degrees Celsius. And this yellow line is the freezing level at about, it looks to be right around, I'm looking at the elevation here looks to be about 12,000 feet. So that's pretty high, probably no hail. But if I saw that freezing level closer to the ground, I would be worried about hail. So you can see the, the thunderstorm updraft has got really strong updraft, bringing rain and precipitation way up here where it's getting cold. Eventually that will drop down to the surface and we can actually scan the storm in the vertical to see what it's looking at. So Doppler radar can tell us a lot of things about what's going on in the storm. Um, without actually being under them. So when you see this on TV, remember, this is a radar shooting a beam of microwave energy into the storm and bouncing back. Now, occasionally we see other things on radar. You may have heard me talk about this. We see bugs. Sometimes we see bats. We see birds. Sometimes we see smoke. Any particles in the atmosphere that mimic or look similar to raindrops or snowflakes can reflect the radar beam. And so we use the dual pole radar, which has different products to kind of tell us what's going on in the storm. There's actually numerous products we can show. I can show four at a time here. And you can see the different products we can see. One is reflectivity, which you see everywhere on TV, on your phone, online. This is the Doppler winds. This is something we call the correlation coefficient. It tells us whether all the droplets or particles in the atmosphere are the same size. When we see particles that aren't the same size next to each other, that means they're different shapes. So birds and bugs sometimes will show up like that, but also debris in a tornado. This is how we can detect a tornado on the ground. Remember, if a tornado is hitting the ground, it's not gonna have raindrops that are uniform, which are relatively all the same size. When a tornado picks up leaves, debris, parts of homes, trees, those are all different shapes. And that will show up on the radar as a very cool color, or in this case, uh, we would see a little hole of lower colors in this uh, blue shade. That would tell us that there's debris. And if it's co-located with a really bright return on the reflectivity and strong winds on the velocity data, we know we've got a tornado. So in fact, a tornado can be detected on the ground by Doppler radar without anybody spotting it, but it has to be within range of the radar. Now, this is great uh, for people that aren't under that storm because this will give us warning ahead of time. The goal oftentimes is to look for some of the indications that a storm is going to produce a tornado. So we will look for rotation in the mid-levels of the storm first before it drops down to the ground. And that's how we would end up issuing tornado warnings. That's why sometimes we get a lot of warnings, even though something doesn't touch down. We're trying to give a heads up before one does touch down. So there is a little bit of a false alarm rate with detecting tornadoes. Um, remember, the whole goal is to warn you before the tornado touches down. If we tell you after it touches down, it doesn't do a whole lot of good. So today's topic on Doppler radar, I know it's a very fascinating thing. There's a whole part of meteorology that focuses just on Doppler radar. People who do research, study storms, study new methods of Doppler radar. Doppler radar is always being updated in advance. There's new software, new technology. And in the future, we're gonna have something called phased array radar. It's something that the military actually uses to track missiles. Um, and this will be the next generation of Doppler radar. The other goal is to put more radars in. As we mentioned, there's a, there's a problem with not having a radar close to you. We have just, uh, you know, they're spread out across the country. We'd love to get small radars. If we can get smaller radars and fill some of these gaps, we can get better data across 
the entire country. So I hope you enjoyed today's topic on Doppler radar. It's always one of those things that fascinates me. It's probably the number one tool I use during severe weather. Um, a lot of folks have access to Doppler radar, but may not always understand some of the downfalls and some of the things going on and some of the false returns. That's the great thing about being a meteorologist. It's like using an X-ray machine. Even though you could see the X-ray, it takes a trained professional sometimes to understand what's going on in that X-ray, or in this case, the Doppler radar. So if you have any questions, put them in the comments.